So we all read a lot about diabetes these days, and I'm just going to start with a really basic definition so that we're all on the same page about what diabetes is. So um, in a normal situation, the pancreas, which is this organ that's kind of shaped like a trout and sits right here high in the abdomen, um, produces, secretes a, a hormone called insulin that helps the body metabolize sugar and use it as fuel. And when there's no insulin, that blocks the body's ability to use sugar as fuel. Um, so diabetes is a group of diseases that um, are either, uh, in which a person either has, is not producing any insulin at all, or they're not producing enough insulin, or they become unable to use the insulin that is produced. When they're unable to use the sugar, uh, when they're unable to use the sugar as energy, it collects, accumulates in the bloodstream, and that is toxic and destructive to the organs and ultimately leads to organ failure and death. So there are three basic types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes used to be called juvenile diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is the diabetes that we read about a lot and hear about a lot in the news these days, and that's also known as adult onset or insulin-resistant um, diabetes. And then there's type, the third type is gestational diabetes, which is a condition of pregnancy. Breakthrough is about type 1 diabetes, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight. And it's really hard for us to imagine these days, but until 1922, which is when insulin was discovered, type 1 diabetes was an unerringly fatal disease. The um, life expectancy from the point of diagnosis was 12 months at the most, and often quite a bit less. So Breakthrough is really centered around four characters, and they are Elizabeth Hughes, Frederick Banting, Frederick Allen, and Alec Clues. Uh, they're all very, very different personalities, but what they have in common is each one staked his or her all on an idea. Some of them won their bet, some lost their bet, and some did a bit of both, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight. This is the Hughes family in 1916. This photograph was taken as part of uh, Charles Evans Hughes' presidential campaign. In 1916, he ran against um, Woodrow Wilson and very, very nearly won that election. It was, he lost by a very slight margin. In fact, they printed headlines, the newspapers printed headlines that he had won. He went to bed that night thinking he, had, he was the next president of the United States and woke up to find out, whoops. Um, but uh, this photograph shows Charles Evans Hughes on the left. Elizabeth is sitting on his knee. And then there's um, Catherine in the middle and Helen on the right, who was the eldest daughter who died of tuberculosis in 1920. And then Antoinette Hughes on the right. Charles Evans Hughes Jr., their son, was not in this picture because he was uh, in the World War I at the time. So at the time this picture was taken, she was eight years old. Three years after this picture was taken, um, she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. She was 11 at that point. She was 4 foot 11 inches tall, weighed 75 pounds, was a robust outdoorsy girl with a very keen mind and a real independent streak. Within months she would have been dead without treatment. Now luckily Elizabeth was the daughter of Charles Evans Hughes and Antoinette Hughes. Charles Evans Hughes, as I said, was a presidential candidate. He actually resigned from the Supreme Court in order to run for president. He's the only person ever to resign from the Supreme Court to run for the presidency. He, to this day, is the only person in American in history who served as a state governor, associate justice of the Supreme Court, secretary of state, and chief justice of the Supreme Court. So needless to say, through Charles Evans Hughes, Elizabeth was very well connected and was guaranteed the very best medical help that was possible at that time. Now, the very best medical help that a diabetic could hope for at that time was this man, 
Dr. Frederick Madison Allen, also known as Dr. Diabetes. He was a renowned expert, and even today in diabetes research, the years of 1914 to 1922 are known as the Allen years of diabetes research. He was the very first one to understand that it's not just carbohydrates that raises blood sugar, it's also proteins and fats. He developed a treatment, a therapy, that was euphemistically called undernutrition. Essentially, it was starvation. What he sought to find was a very individualized calculus that was the minimum amount of calories required to keep a person alive. Now, Dr. Allen could keep his diabetic patients alive longer than anyone else, but it was through this excruciating starvation therapy, and my guess is that no patient whose doctor saved their life were ever less grateful than Dr. Allen's patients were to him. This is Alec Clues, George Henry Alexander Clues. He was a British-born researcher who really committed professional heresy when he defected from the hidebound establishment of academic research in Europe, which is where he'd been educated in England and Germany, to come to the United States, where he hoped to find more opportunities to express his ingenuity and a real innovative approach to research. Then he really committed heresy when he defected from academic research altogether and joined up with commercial industry. In, the, in, in 1919, the AMA's official stance was that commercial interest and industry and academic research should never, never mix. And it was almost unheard of that this very small pharmaceutical company in Indianapolis called Eli Lilly would approach him and ask him to join with them. Even more unlikely was the fact that he accepted the offer. So this was really one of the very first partnerships between academic research and commercial industry. And of course now we consider these partnerships more the rule than the exception, but not so then. This is Frederick Banting. He was a hard scrabble farm boy from rural Ontario. He grew up in a place where the boys grew up to be farmers, and very, very few, if any, uh, uh, went to school past the eighth grade because they went to work. Well, Frederick, Allen, uh, Frederick Banting not only went through the eighth grade, but he graduated from high school, and then he enrolled at the University of Toronto. He wasn't sure what he wanted to major in. He was really attracted to the fine arts, though, and uh, loved oil painting and continued to be an oil painter throughout his adult life. Um, so he went thinking that maybe he would be an artist, and once he enrolled, he kind of drifted into medicine, and I think we can all agree that uh, the art world's loss is medicine's gain. So I always start a writing project with questions. Some writers and some, sometimes people start writing projects because there's something that they want to say. And sometimes we start writing projects because there's something we want to find out. And this was a case of the latter. <coughs> Breakthrough is organized around four central questions. And as I go through the presentation tonight, I'm going to pause four times and see if the question that I had in my mind at that point in the research is the same question that you're thinking about now. So we're going to do a little test. Are you all willing to play this game with me? All right. OK, great. Let's begin. Thank you. Let's go back to August 1922. Picture this. Elizabeth, remember I said she was 11, 4 feet 11 and 75 pounds when she was diagnosed with type 1. So now it's three years later. August 1922, she's uh, 14 years old, she's 5 feet tall, and she weighs 45 pounds. In the three years since her diagnosis, she's outlived the life expectancy by three times over, but she's also lost almost half of her body weight. She is survived by the devoted efforts of her nurse, Blanche Burgess, and also through Frederick Allen's starvation treatment. For all their wealth and power, Antoinette and Charles Evans Hughes were unable to save their eldest daughter, Helen, from dying from a really horrible death of tuberculosis in April 1920. And now, two years later, in August of 1922, 
it seemed that it was happening all over again with their youngest daughter, Elizabeth. So in 1922, Elizabeth had been starving for more than three years. She's bald, her skin is slack and scaly, and she's too weak to stand up without help. Four days before her 15th birthday, her mother, Antoinette, takes her, Elizabeth, and her nurse, Blanche Burgess, to Toronto, a city that neither one of them have ever been to and in which they know no one. Antoinette entrusts her daughter to an unemployed surgeon who has almost no experience with patients other than dogs in a lab or casualties in the trenches of France. He has no hospital privileges, so Antoinette rents an apartment near the lab where he works. This is Frederick Banting. And then she leaves Toronto, goes back to Washington, D.C., and gets on a ship bound for Rio de Janeiro with her husband, Charles Evans Hughes. It's a two-week sea journey each way, and this is long before the time of easy ship-to-shore radio. So here's the first question. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> that was my question. All right, you passed the first test. Should we go on? Awesome. Yes, Frederick Allen could keep diabetic patients alive longer than anyone else, but he did so by starving them really starving them. They were alive, yes, but they were really hardly living. And sometimes they weren't living at all because that inflection point of the exact minimum number of calories was very, very hard and it fluctuated from day to day and sometimes his patients just died of starvation rather than really from diabetes. Alan recognized that his therapy would really not work as an outpatient therapy, that it had to be inpatient, because very few people, certainly not parents, could stand by and watch as a child slowly and painfully starved to death. But he could. So he begged and borrowed enough money to establish the Physiatric Institute in Morristown, New Jersey. It's this palatial estate. It was basically a huge elegant, silent tomb, populated almost entirely by staring skeletons, most of them children. Any questions? Any guesses on question number two? That was my question. And the answer is, he could because Alan believed with all of his heart and soul that a cure for diabetes was very, very near at hand. I mean, he thought the phone could ring any second with someone, and they were really on the cusp of it for years and years. So he didn't want any of his patients to die five minutes before the miracle happened. So he held them in this state, hoping against hope that any day now, 24 hours more, one more day, one more day, he might be able to save them. Alan devoted everything, everything, all of his heart, all of his money, all of his time to saving diabetics. And ironically, as soon as this wonderful thing happened, the discovery of insulin, it really ruined him. It ruined him professionally and personally. He ended up dying penniless and forgotten. Here's the dream team that found the discovered insulin in 1922. Each of them had a special talent or ability that they brought to the mix that allowed them to get it right when for thousands of years there had been nothing but frustration and failure. Incredibly, they were really only in the same place at the same time working on the same project for a period of about six months. But somehow, in that brief window, they were able to produce an extract from the pancreas that was pure enough to use in humans for the very first time in history. 
Of course, diabetes had been known and recognized for thousands of years. The Egyptians, the Chinese, the Persians, the Greeks had all written about it. But it really wasn't until the late 19th century that we understood that the problem of diabetes centered in the pancreas. And we learned that by uh, removing, depancreatizing a dog, and then the dog very quickly developed diabetic symptoms. Unfortunately, that was only half the battle. And purifying that extract turned out to be incredibly complicated and difficult. And really, until 1922, the technology to do that on any kind of large scale didn't even exist. But that's when this guy showed up. This is Frederick Banting. So upon graduating from the University of Toronto with a medical degree, he immediately shipped overseas to a battlefield in France where he had lots of opportunity to practice his specialty, orthopedic surgery, amputations in the trenches. He actually almost lost his arm. He was injured himself. And I think if he'd lost his arm, that would have been a bit of a setback for a surgeon. I think we can all agree. But he survived, and his arm survived, and they both returned as a decorated war veteran to Toronto, where he found himself unable, suddenly unable, to find a job. Here he'd invested everything in this education, but now he was unable to persuade anyone to hire him. So he borrowed money from his dad, and he moved to the second largest city in, in Ontario, which is London, Ontario. And he bought a house, and he hung out a shingle, and he opened a private practice. And his first month in business, he made $4. <laughs> and subsequent months, not that much better. His fiance and he parted company. Things were looking really grim for Frederick Banting. He was having a lot of those sleepless, restless nights, tossing and turning and wondering where he went wrong and full of remorse and regret and self-recrimination. And during one of those nights, he awakes from a restless sleep with an idea about a subject that he really knows nothing about, endocrinology. Right here, in this room, in this bed, he fumbles around on the bedside table looking for something to write with, and he scrawls 25 words that would change history. And here they are. Here's his original note. I'll read it to you. Diabetes, ligate pancreatic ducts of dogs. Keep dogs alive till asini degenerate. Leave eyelets. Try to isolate the internal secretion of these to relieve glycosuria. Now, interestingly, this idea is not really new. And technically, it's not right. But Banting was so unfamiliar with the, with the literature in endocrinology that he didn't know that. And so he pursued it with fervor and conviction. He found his way to this man, J.J.R. McLeod, who was a renowned expert in metabolism. And he was the head of the physiology department at the University of Toronto. Banting, who's on fire with this idea, basically charges into McLeod's office and demands that McLeod let him use a lab for the summer so that he can prove his theory. Well, McLeod, of course, is very familiar with the literature, and so McLeod really knows that Banting's idea is not really new and not really right. But he lets him use the lab anyway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. One of those wonderful twists of fate. What McLeod did was he gave Banting eight weeks, 12 dogs, one lab, and one undergraduate assistant named Charlie Best. That summer was the hottest summer in Toronto in 100 years. Banting cut the sleeves off his lab coat and still, sweat was pouring into the open cavities of the dogs that they were operating on, depancreatizing. I guess unsurprisingly, under those circumstances, at the end of the eight weeks, they'd lost all 12 dogs to surgical debacles or to infection, and they had nothing to show for it. So Banting sold his car and some surgical instruments so that he could continue the work. Eventually, they depancreatized a dog and kept it alive for 20 days. 
When that dog died, uh-oh, there we go. When that dog da died, Banting wrote in his journal, I shall never forget that dog as long as I shall live. I have seen patients die, and I've never shed a tear. But when that dog died, I wanted to be alone, for the tears would fall despite anything I could do. The extract that he and Best used did, in fact, lower the blood glucose of the dog, but it was very impure, painful to inject, and caused large abscesses to form at the injection site, so not pure enough to use with humans. It was also very difficult to produce in any quantity. But at the end of the summer, McLeod returned, and he did two things. One is he assigned Bert Collip to work on the project. Now, Bert Collip was a brilliant biochemist who just happened to be in Toronto on a visiting fellowship. He was really from Alberta and worked there. Um, so that was a really great thing because he helped with the purification, which was the thing that was vexing Banting and Best. The other thing that McLeod did was he arranged for Banting and Best to present their findings at a meeting of the American Physiological Society that was held at Yale in Connecticut. When the agenda went out for that meeting, it was, you know, the shot heard around the world. Every diabetic expert, uh, every medical expert heard that there had been a breakthrough, and they all were in that room. It was packed, standing room only. In the room was, of course, Alan and Joslyn. Elliot Joslyn was there, a name that many of you may have heard. And also, Clues was there. Alec Clues actually boarded a train in Indianapolis on Christmas morning. He left his family on Christmas morning to get on a train so that he would be sure to be in Connecticut in that room when that paper was read. Here he is standing with McLeod. So at the end of the talk, Clues is a believer. He marches up to McLeod and shakes his hand and says, I think this is great. I totally believe you. I'm going to go back to Indianapolis. I'm going to tell Eli, Eli Lilly to underwrite the entire project to develop and produce this, and we're going to take care of all the expenses. What do you think McLeod said? <laughs> you read the book. No. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, she's listening. I love it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. He said, no thanks. He said, we don't want help from, one, commercial industry, and two, Americans. We want to keep it Canadian. <laughs> so McLeod went back to Toronto, and Clues went back to Indianapolis. And one month later, Leonard Thompson became the very first human ever to receive insulin in Toronto. He was, uh, let's see, he was 14 years old and 65 pounds when his father carried him into Toronto General Hospital. He was first injected with Banting's concoction, which didn't work to lower blood glucose, and then he was injected with Collip's uh, concoction, which did work. Immediately, newspapers around the world published headlines that Toronto had found a cure for diabetes. And then there was this vexing setback. In the spring of 1922, Toronto somehow lost the ability to produce any insulin at all. They were doing the same thing that they'd always done, but they weren't able to produce any effective extract. And now, patients who had initially been saved by insulin were starting to die. So, meanwhile, the train stations in Toronto were filling up with mothers with their skeletal children's in their, children in their arms because they'd read the headlines and they were coming for the cure. And Banting was in a position of turning them all away. There was no insulin. Letters arrived every day by the box full. Please save my son. Please save my brother, my daughter. Here's a letter that's simply addressed to the doctor who cures diabetes, Toronto, Ontario. One letter was written by Antoinette Hughes, begging Banting to accept her daughter Elizabeth as his patient. She was, the she was the wife of the uh, Secretary of State. Banting said, no, there's no insulin. Slowly, in the springtime, after weeks, Toronto regained its ability to make insulin, but it was far from perfect. The, um, 
the potency was really variable. Sometimes it was very, very strong and it sent patients into insulin shock. Sometimes it was very, very weak and it didn't really serve to lower blood glucose levels. And actually there was not enough of either kind anyway. And so, reluctantly, Toronto was forced to accept Eli Lilly's offer of help. By the time that Clues walked into Toronto, into the scene, uh, the um, relations in Toronto among the four Discovery members had become so acrimonious that there at least one fist fight had broken out in the lab. Clues was probably the only guy who could walk into that kind of emotional climate and not even bat an eye. He was positively bristling with energy and ideas. And he was uniquely able to command respect from both scientists and from business people. Uh, Eli Lilly said of him, he lived more hours in a day than any man I know. To give you an idea of just how difficult relations had gotten among the four Discovery Team members, in 1923, McLeod and Banting would win the Nobel Prize for medicine, yet they were so uh, angry at each other that they both refused to go to Stockholm to accept the prize because they didn't want to share a stage with each other. <laughs> and to this day, there exists not a single photograph of the four members of the Discovery Team within a single frame. Meanwhile, Eli Lilly threw everything they had into production of insulin. They really wanted to make sure that they could make enough so that everybody who needed it could have it. The lights never went out in the lab. They encountered many of the same problems that Toronto had encountered. Work was so taxing that George Walden, who was in charge of the lab, almost had a nervous breakdown. Clues um, intervened and forced him to take a month off. But while he was away, his second in command, who had taken over for him, did have a nervous breakdown. Eventually, though, Walden was able to crack the code of large-scale insulin production through a method that he devised called isoelectric precipitation. It took about two years from Banting's late-night epiphany to Eli Lilly's large-scale production of insulin. Toronto's cost was about $1,400. Eli Lilly's uh, cost for developing was about $250,000. So um, today it takes about 10 years and a billion dollars to bring a biotech drug to market. 1923 proved to be Eli Lilly's most profitable year. This slide shows um, that in 1954 it took 10,000 pounds of pancreas gland to make one pound of insulin crystals. You can see the insulin crystals there in the foreground. Thankfully, we are no longer uh, reliant on animal pancreas to produce insulin. In 1978, a small startup called Genentech, um, working with City of Hope Hospital, produced synthetic insulin using recombinant DNA techniques for the first time. It licensed the idea for development to Eli Lilly. Sound familiar? In 1982, it was approved by the FDA and in 1983, it was sold as Humulin. And uh, insulin continues to be one of Eli Lilly's leading products. All of this brings me back to the last and maybe the most complex question. Let's see if you come up with the same question that I came up with at the end of the story. So let's go back to Toronto. 1922. Through a combination of influence and luck, Elizabeth gets to Toronto and meets Banting. He injects her with insulin. She immediately begins an amazing recovery. She becomes his famous case, his claim to fame, kind of a poster child. Within weeks, remember how she arrived in Toronto, five feet tall, 15 years old, 45 pounds. Within weeks, she looked and acted like a completely normal girl. Overnight, her caloric intake per day went from 300 calories a day to 2,500 calories a day. She likened it to a fairy tale. 
She was able to eat bread, plums, bananas, macaroni and cheese, things that she hadn't been able to eat for years. She gained two pounds a week, and for the first time in years, she started to grow in height. So newspapers around the world carried stories about her. Naturally, other diabetics reached out to her hoping for encouragement, inspiration, and you'd think she'd be very happy to oblige, right? Not so much. So it turns out that during those three years of starvation, the thing that she had dreamed and wanted more than anything was to be normal. And now she has a chance to be that. The last thing she wants to do is be a spokesperson for diabetes or insulin. Even with insulin, diabetes is an incredibly greedy disease. It requires almost constant attention. So Elizabeth really didn't want to give it five more minutes than she had to. Three months after she arrived in Toronto, Elizabeth is ready to leave Toronto and begin a brand new life as a completely normal girl. She doesn't keep in touch with Banting or Blanche or any of the other children. I know from my own diabetes, it, I know over time it takes a lot of adjustment and sometimes as you age it takes more adjustment. And I was wondering if she had to go through that same thing, particularly in the early years when, when they probably had to refine the, diabetic, the insulation more and whatnot. Did she have to do that, or? Yeah, not not just the insulin, but maybe the maybe the amount. The amount, yes. You know that's such a great question. So as I said, thank you so much for that. She was she was taking insulin, as I said, for 58 years, and insulin itself and the delivery mechanism changed so much. Diabetes management changed so much in those 58 years. To give you an idea, when, when Elizabeth st started injecting insulin, she did so with a glass syringe with a steel needle that she was obliged to sharpen on a whetstone before every injection. This is a 24 gauge needle. And um, the variation of potency was so dramatic from batch to batch in the early in the early days that at one point she was you know she would always hope 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 for a really really potent batch because then she would just have a small amount to inject but um, there was this one time when it was kind of a weak batch that was delivered and uh, she had to inject five cc's and her syringe only held um, two cc's so what she did she said it took 45 minutes she wrote about this. Um, Blanche stuck the needle in, they injected two cc's, then unscrewed the barrel, put mo two more cc's, left the needle in, screwed it back in, injected that, then unscrewed it again, filled it with one cc, and put it back in for the last cc. So that's how it was in the beginning. And of course now, you know, pumps, disposable needles, a lot finer needles. So yes, there were lots of ingest, uh, adjustments. Um, not just delivery, but also insulin changed so much. In the 30s, they developed long-acting insulin. Now they've discovered that long-acting, ins fast-acting insulin actually has some advantages. Um, there were, as you saw, synthetic insulin. Um, and then uh, before there was synthetic insulin, there was uh, also a difference between pork insulin and beef insulin. S certain people had allergies to certain kinds of insulin. So many adjustments all along the way and sadly um, there were some early diabetics who died taking insulin from insulin shock um, overdoses in the early days diabetics were were obliged to uh, carry around cards that said i am not drunk i am diabetic because they would be find found kind of in these stupors and police would pick them up and throw them in the brink so um, yeah, a lot has changed. A lot did change. There were many, many adjustments. And she was such a diligent student of it. You know, she kept those careful charts that she was able to make those minute adjustments. And that, I think, really contributed to her longevity. Um, so publicly, Elizabeth was very 
quiet about her illness, but it sounds like privately she kept journals or she kept more, you said she wrote about the, the shots and things. Did she do that her entire life or did, was she even, did she even ignore the illness in her private life, so to speak, in her internal life? That's a great question. Um, so uh, where she wrote about it was in letters. Elizabeth, her health was so fragile that during these three years of starvation, she was obliged to uh, live away from her parents for most of the, that time. Um, they didn't think that she could, uh, she was too fragile to withstand a Washington winter. So in the win her last winter, 1921, she spent in Bermuda. And she, she was a prolific letter writer, very close to her family, and she wrote sometimes three or four or five letters a day. Um, so we have a lot of this writing is th right up through August of 1922 when she received insulin and, and um, when her parents were on the ship, she was still writing. So, but, but not journaling so much, but these, these charts, you know, tell such a story. They really, you know, um, it's such a minute way of tracking your daily experience. So she was very private about it in her private life. As I mentioned, she, she didn't um, even tell her children until they were uh, of age and um, didn't talk about it with them. They were all sworn to secrecy, um, was only willing to have it disclosed after her death. I think she would have loved the idea that none of her obituaries mentioned diabetes. Uh, you know, I think there are a few people who really could appreciate the extraordinariness of ordinary life the way she could. Um, but uh, no, very private about it after she, really, there's this break. It's almost like, it's almost like Elizabeth Hughes never left Toronto. When she left, she, it was, she was a different person. It was a new life. She was a normal girl. That was then. This is now. We don't talk about it. diabetes. What's my personal connection with diabetes? Well, you know, it's interesting. The, the CDC just came out with a report saying that um, if current trends continue, by 2050, one in three Americans will develop diabetes in their lifetime. So um, I think they're, you know, we're all probably, uh, I often ask people to raise their hands if they have a personal connection, and my hand goes up. Um, my, I have family members who are diabetic, um, both those who um, injected insulin and those who are trying to manage it in other ways, type 2. Um, so I do have a personal connection. I myself am not diabetic. Yeah. So as a writer, how, how did you come to find this story and decide to write a book about it? Oh, you know, um, the characters, it wasn't, it wasn't that I was interested in diabetes and then discovered the characters. These characters are so compelling. This story is, is the humanity of it and the courage and the conviction and the history, you know, the intersections of politics and it's amazing, politics and medicine these partnerships that were unprecedented. Um, the first time that, that uh, Banting applied for a patent, he was rejected by the United States Patent Office. And it was only after a letter um, written by Charles Evans Hughes that he was gra granted the patent. But, you know, why was it that he changed his mind and said no to Antoinette first and then, and then said yes? So it's really, it was these coincidences, these unbelievable um, circumstances, these decisions, um, they're just, it was such an amazing story. It was kind of one of those stories that you think, uh, I c it pulled me through the research because I kept thinking it can't be true. And I, I don't believe it. The str truth really being stranger than fiction. So uh, the characters really were the things that were so compelling. The, the initial germ of it was that my um, my co-author had read an, an article in the New York Times. It was a very brief article. 
in the New York Times Magazine in two, March of 2003 that mentioned um, uh, Elizabeth. And it was kind of a thing where you scratch the, so you think, oh, that's interesting, and you Google it, you know, scratch the surface, and then you think, huh. And you look a little deeper, and then you think, what? And then you look a little deeper, and it just was kind of that way. Um, one of the things, though, that was, that was initially perplexing to me was, I do, you know, I do have diabetes in my family, and I consider myself a relatively educated person, but I'd never heard the name Banting. And as prevalent as diabetes is, wouldn't you think that we would all know that name? Now, I don't know anybody who has polio, but I know the name Jonas Salk. So how is it that I'd never heard? That's just really, I, that struck me as very odd. And so I, I did some searching to try to discover who he was. So that was part of it. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry, I think that went around and around. Did you ever get question one answered? How did she leave her daughter with basically an unknown person and take off to Rio? Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. And of course, you have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't plant her, but I could have. That was great. I'm not going to give it all away now. Are there any plans to turn this into a movie? Oh. Now that one really should have been a plant, right? Next time. Thank you. There should be. Any agents in the, in the audience here? You know, the whole time that, that we were researching this, really, it presented itself. I saw it as a movie. I saw it as a movie. It just unfolded cinematically. It's such a sweeping story, and these characters are so larger than life. And even as I was writing it, you know, I kind of started to think about who I would cast in various, in various roles. So yeah, I would love it. Do we have, do we have some more questions? Any comments? People want to share their, their experiences? Oh, we have a question coming up from the back. Okay, um, with such impure insulin, how could Elizabeth not be ID'd as diabetic by insulin reactions? So, um, that's a great question. Early on, Blanche Burgess was her constant companion. Elizabeth had not traveled, she had not spent five minutes by herself in the three and a half years or so that she was starving. Blanche even slept in the same bed as she did so that if she did have a reaction, she would feel it and be able to respond immediately. And they kept little molasses kisses on the bedside table to address those right away. So um, there were lots of reactions and sometimes she had four a night when insulin was so impure, if you can imagine. it just went on and on. So there were a lot of reactions. And, it, and as I said, really, Elizabeth was so diligent and so disciplined about um, taking care of her disease. She was never careless. Uh, and so um, I think that really contributed to her longevity. But there were reactions, and she did, she was really saved in the early days when the impurity was really a problem by Blanche. So how long did Blanche remain in her life? When they left, when she left Toronto, yeah, Blanche moved to, and that's a whole, oh boy, yes, oh, I would love to get into that one. We don't have time. That's a whole different science cafe. That is some story, though. That is some story. Sorry? I sh it would have to be fiction, though, because it's, it's, um, there are no facts. Boy, we tried. Oh my goodness, did we try to uncover, you know, to uncover what happened there. Um, it's really, it's really mysterious. Did Blanche do any journaling or any reporting or anything like that? 
No one knows. She. Oh, thank you. Did Blanche do any journaling? So when Blanche when Blanche left, she moved to uh, California, at least according to Elizabeth's letters, and. She, Ostensibly, she was going to be married to someone, but she didn't end up marrying that person, and she ended up, we did finally track down that she, when she died, and she did die in California, but there is really no, I mean, it is my hope and prayer that at one of these book talks, someone is going to come up to me and say, Blanche Burgess was my aunt or my my mother or and I'm going to find out the mystery of Blanche Burgess what you know she really what a hero what a what a remarkable role she played and um, we just don't know all I have is a death certificate that's the only piece of paper I have after August 22nd documenting her life not for lack of looking Did uh, Elizabeth's pregnancies cause any complications with the diabetes? Amazing, isn't it? Wouldn't you think she had these three healthy children who were non-diabetics? Was her health ever compromised? Yes. It's amazing. She really is a remarkable, it's a remarkable life. Do we have any final questions? Okay, we quit. Um, so this may seem a little tangential, but when you talked about um, Dr. Allen's starvation therapy, I'm wondering if the medical professionals at the time considered that to be ethical. And today, we have debates about quality versus quantity of life. And I'm wondering if you know what like the AMA's ethics stand is on something like that. Wow, that is such a great question. These are great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. These are the best questions. Yes. I just say yes. <laughs> it is, can you imagine, as a, as a parent of a di type 1 diabetic child, do you, and there were doctors at the time who said, just give them a big birthday party all the cake and whatever their favorite foods are that they can eat and let them go out with a bang. You know, they'll be dead in two weeks, but it'll be a great, you know. And then there were people who, who, you know, stayed with the starvation treatment. And what is, it's kind of, it's almost the choice of, do you want a short, which is better, a short painful death or a long painful death? You know, which one of those is, is more humane? And what if, you chose short, painful death, and then a week later, they discovered insulin. It, it was. There were doctors who, who did not uh, refer patients to um, Allen's, who did not agree with his methods, and yet he could keep patients alive longer. Now, sadly, you know, I think there were three of his original 100 patients that he treated who survived long enough to get insulin. So it, it was not many, but you know, Elizabeth was one. I think it was, I think it was controversial. I mean, there were doctors who, who thought, no, it's just too ruthless. It's too horrible, no. You know, life at any cost, it's really, you know, you have to make that decision at what what is, the, what is the quality of life? It's very difficult, and he really walked that line. And as I said, you know, that inflection point was hard to track from even from, you know, as we know, blood sugar is affected, geez, it, it's affected by, by climate, emotional state, how well you slept last night. It, that inflection point varies from hour to hour, from person to person. It's very hard to track. So, yeah, it was a tough very difficult call for um, for the parents, not just for the diabetics, but for the parents to make. And you know, it's one of the reasons why we put Elizabeth and her mom on the cover of the book. In many ways, it's a decision that a journey that they took together, even though, you know, Antoinette wasn't the diabetic. 